I recently had a person contact me and the person was talking about, you know, and, uh, and you know, hurting him, himself or herself. And this was all because of uh, blushing, you know, because of shyness and blushing. And yeah, because it's been so many years that I, I've had this problem and I think if you had this problem for say 20, 30 years and it was really intense, you'd end up, your brain would end up frying or something, you'd end up having a breakdown. But what happens is I think the brain then um, lets go, you just you know, you mature, or you know, you you know, the, the brain just lets go and says, okay, you know, somehow um, it, it actually deals with it, but not in a, in a sense where you become this super confident person. No, but uh, uh, in a way where you um, just accept it, you know, and you accept that you're uh, weird or different or sensitive, and you just get on with life. You, you adapt to circumstances. For example, you, you, may, you may not go to, um, you may not go to social gatherings, but you could at least, you know, go to. You could at least go to the supermarket, like I have done. Go to the supermarket and speak to, you know. Um, you know, if you're a man and, for example, you don't go to parties or you don't go to uh, disco or nightclubs or whatever and you can't meet any beautiful women or pretty girls, you can have a feel of uh, normality or whatever that is. By, for example, going to the supermarket and there's a really pretty cashier, you know, you can speak to her, you know, because you're doing your shopping and she has to, well, she doesn't have to speak to you, but, you know. You know, you can uh, engage in some kind of small talk. So, you know, m my life has been like this, you know, my, and uh, you have to accept that you're different to other people. You know, you are, uh, you're different, you're sensitive. But that sensitivity can be, you can, you can desensitize yourself to certain situations. You know, so for example, if the if um, you're afraid of, I don't know, anything, you can desensitize yourself, and you can sit down, have a cup of tea or something, have a, um, a pen and paper or on the computer. The pen and paper with me works better. But there's, you know, I find I can be much more creative when I have when I'm holding a pen in my hand and writing inside a, you know, a notebook. You know, the feel of the paper, the, the feel of me writing that. I don't know, it's just, 
it, uh, the connection to my brain is different somehow. I, I don't know how it works. Um, yeah, and so you know when you're writing down on a piece of paper, on an A4 piece of paper, you can write down all your ideas, you can brainstorm, you can tear that piece of paper out and then lay it down on a table and then write down on another piece of paper and you can spread everything out and you can see everything uh, from a like a plan view as if from a bird's eye view and you can see more of your ideas you know that's why I like working with uh, pen and paper you know a notebook or even a, a massive A3 size paper you know instead of a computer but you know if you like using the computer just use a computer uh, the advantages of a computer is if you make mistakes then you can you can uh, easily uh, erase them and anyway think about this carefully and start to dissect the the monster because people uh, what we tend to do is we think of this blushing thing as as just one uh, huge phenomenon, a huge problem, and we we don't dissect it because if you if you dissect it, if you cut it up into small pieces, that monster is you know like I don't know maybe a, a few hundred gremlins. You know you can squash a gremlin, you can destroy the monster bit by bit. Maybe if you don't want to destroy the monster, you can use another word like you can tame this monster bit by bit you know once you uh, it's like I don't know which approach you want to take but you can caress one of these gremlins and they'll disappear and then go to the next gremlin or little monster caress it and it'll disappear or you can destroy the gremlin or the little monster and then onto the next one onto the next one and these little gremlins or monsters what they are is little parts of your problem by destroying one part or softly dissolving one part you actually slowly slowly you make this big monster smaller and smaller and smaller and then you re you'll end up realizing that it's actually it's not a massive problem anymore and there could be uh, you could get to a point where um, you know a certain gremlin, say the green and purple gremlin, is so hard to tackle. And so, okay, you put this one to the side, this situation or this problem, this... this area to the side and go on to smaller areas, smaller monsters that you can attack. You know, I know I explain it in a kind of childish way, but, you know, I'm childish. Sorry. So what? Uh, but, you know, you can explain it in your, in your own way. You know, you have your own personality, your own character, whatever. Um, you know, you might think that psychiatrist or psychotherapist can can do better a better job you know why am I trying to explain something I'm not a doctor but uh, in my experience psychiatrists psychologists they can't do much they can't um, I'm not saying they don't have um, knowledge of course they have knowledge you know they they have a lot of knowledge a lot of experience they have techniques but unless you have actually experienced this blushing problem for years or decades they well I'm not saying I'm the best person because I'm not a doctor but uh, people who have experienced um, this phobia for years as I have I think can shed a, a new light or a different light or can can, ex, can um, uh, approach the the problem from a from uh, a perspective of, of somebody who's who's actually uh, uh, lived or 
is still living uh, this problem. I don't know if I make sense, you know. And you can see I'm not editing anything. I'm just rambling on, you know. Because the, the reason why I made this video is because I was quite concerned. There was a, a person who contacted me and uh, they said they, they were about to commit... And I thought, no, how do I deal with this? You know, and I think, okay, I have enough. If if they wanted to commit because of some reason, some reason you know, that I couldn't help them with, then you know, I just go and say to them, like, just seek um, professional advice, see a doctor, take some antidepressants. But the person wanted to commit because of blushing, and I'm thinking, okay, look, I have to say something. I have to try and save this person I have to try and help them and so I thought okay what can I say you know in my mind I know I'm not a doctor but I have ideas and okay these are my ideas it's not worth it you know and I said to people before you know there is light at the end of the tunnel you know but when you're in the tunnel you feel just blackness you feel there's no way out and you know, some teenagers, because it ha st happened to me when I was from, oh, um, I think from 13, 14. I remember when I was 17, it really, the, the first time my friend said to me, oh, my friend Jerry, we were playing pool, and I became really red. And he said to me, oh, Jero, you're pumping, which meant blood is pumping into your face. And I had to avoid the situation. I went to the toilets and I saw my face was so red. I put my head into cold water. I tried to make it come down. And why? All because of faulty thinking. Because a man has to, uh, a man can't get embarrassed. A man can't go red. A man isn't supposed to be shy. A man isn't supposed to tremble and, uh, you know, feel anxiety, you know, because you know, he's considered weak. Or in my case, I was Italian, an Italian kid growing up, you know, considered gay, you know, if you're not strong, if you're not masculine, you know, and I ended up, I suppose, being uh, sidelined, I don't know if that's the, the right word, by my relatives, because they knew that Gerald was a bit weird, because I never... Uh, attended the social or family gatherings and so you know there was a period where I felt really bad you know there was no internet there weren't hardly any books there was a book by I think a Abraham's Abraham something um, how to cope with fear I think it's called I have to try and dig it out in, in the 1990s and it explained how to cope with anxiety and fear by uh, reasoning, reasoning with it, you know, reasoning it out in your mind, and also relaxing yourself. And I thought, what's this? You know, this isn't an answer. But actually, uh, time has gone by, and I've realised uh, those two things are really important. You know, so obviously, this person, this this author, had a lot of experience and you know, decades have gone by and I think, wow, that is the answer, to relax yourself and to logically, logically think about, you know, why, why should I feel embarrassed, you know, and why is embarrassment or blushing or shyness so bad? Why is it so bad? It's not bad. You know, in my on my channel, 
I always show myself to be an idiot. I'm an idiot. I'm stupid. I'm fat. You know, I'm a failure. And that's great. I, I don't give a shit. You know, of course you do. You, of course you do care. But, uh, you know, going back to the person who um, wrote to me, all I can say to you and anybody who's considering or considering hurting themselves, you know, please go and see a professional. And don't be afraid of seeing a professional because they should be able to put you on an antidepressant. I was I was put on Seroxat, um, not for blushing. <sighs> oh, I have to rewind a bit. I was seeing a therapist just for a just for a few weeks. I'll, I'll, I'll go back. I'll go back even further. I was attending Tai Chi class, and the teacher, this teacher, he was on TV actually. He was really good, a good teacher, and he he was impressed by my slow movements. And he said, "Wow, you can you can really do well. You can go far if you train in Tai Chi." And you know, so I liked this teacher, but then I realized he he had a problem. He couldn't drive on the motorway. I said, "Oh, really? You?" Because I, I explained to him I have anxieties about you know, being in a group of people and social gatherings. And so he said to me, well, I actually have anxiety, you know, when all the students left, I have an anxiety uh, about driving on the motorway. I get panic attacks. And I said, oh, really? Because I looked up, looked up to this guy who was on TV and, uh, you know, and he can do things that I couldn't do. But the thing that I could do, like, it was impossible for him, almost impossible. I thought... You know, I couldn't stand up and do Tai Chi in front of an audience on TV. I couldn't teach, you know, men and women Tai Chi, even even though I love Tai Chi. But I can't, you know, the social phobia stopped me from studying, from going to classes in the first place and teaching and things like that. So, um, so for him, for example my situation would would seem silly you know there's nothing wrong with standing in front of people and and doing this you know they're just people you know but i would i would feel that his anxiety is silly you know you just driving on the motorway yeah it takes a bit to get used to and that's it i wouldn't have a panic attack you know unless i crashed unless there's i overtook on well not on a motorway you know, unless there was a crash on the other lanes and, the, and there was a there was a, a lorry there was an oncoming lorry you know um how do you call it um jackknife into me you know then i would panic you know but anybody would panic you know it's a life-threatening situation but going back to uh this teacher why am i explaining what am i talking about this teacher because he introduced me into a psychotherapist that he was seeing and the psychotherapist, I saw her just for maybe two sessions. She was a nice lady, young lady. And she said, well, for your social phobia, why don't you try Prozac? It's a new drug. It was a new drug at the time in the 1990s. Um, you know, I was really worried, you know, what's it going to do to my brain? Is it going to fry my brain while I go nuts? Uh, because I'd, I'd read uh, Prozac Nation. Prozac Nation is a, a book about the development of Prozac, you know, and they experimented with uh, uh, old, well, first of all, there was tricyclic drugs like amitriptyline, and then they came up with new drugs, and new drugs, they experimented on rats and gave them cancer, I think brain tumors and things like that, and, and explained, you know, the history of how Prozac came about, and what a wonderful drug, you know, it's wonder drug, you know what it could do it can turn a shy person into a, like a massively confident person so i thought oh, okay i'll try it the biggest mistake of my life well it wasn't my mistake i thought she's a therapist she knows boy was she wrong she was absolutely wrong prozac uh, I, well i took prozac for about um one or two weeks my goodness I've never taken cocaine, but I'm just saying uh, 
it's like I was on cocaine. I was like out of control. I was I was too confident. You know, I nearly had a fight with two kids. I was playing football with some uh, friends from my friend's workplace. And two guys, two kids, like teenagers, you know, about 15 or 16, they came with the Amer American pit bull and uh, the pit bull wanted to play with the, our, our ball. And I said, just give me the ball back, please. Because they said, nah, my dog wants to play with it. And they were really, uh, tried to be tough anyway. I just, I walked into them. I, I was, I tried to grab, I think I grabbed one of them and I, I drove them all the way back to the, um, there was a fence. And this dog was just barking at me. It's like, I didn't see any danger. I was so confident. And one guy who, he was a, he was a boxer. He, uh, he came and just grabbed me from behind and he pulled me away. And he said, calm down, man, calm down. I thought, nah, that isn't me. That is not me. You know, how can I lose control like that? So then I decided, I can't take this, this shit, this, this stuff. It's making me too confident. You know, I, I was just, uh, I realized there was something wrong. There's nothing wrong with being confident, but to the point where you're really aggressive with that confidence, nah, I, I just didn't like it. I couldn't accept it. So what happened was, I came, I, I just threw the, the the tablets away and then I felt down, you know, because I had, uh, I didn't have much of a withdrawal because I hadn't taken it for that long. I suppose depression was coming back or my brain chemistry was adjusted. So I thought, no, I'm never going to take any antidepressants again. But six months later, it's a long story, but... I had lots of arguments with my my then girlfriend, you know, she was pregnant and I had loads of pressure from the family to get married and stuff. I had, anyway, my I felt, in my brain I felt um, tingling, you know, my brain actually felt numb. I had to go to the hospital and uh, I'm not sure if I was on the, on the verge of a breakdown or something like that, but uh, it wasn't good. And so what happened was the on-duty psychiatrist said, uh, are you stressed out? Are you depressed? I said, well, of course, my girlfriend, this and this, you know, I explained everything. And uh, to cut a long story short, she made an appointment for me to see a psychiatrist. I went to see the psychiatrist. He asked the same question, are you depressed? I said, yeah. And he said, take this drug, Seroxat. I took Seroxat. He said, Within a few months, you'll be a new man. It's true, I was a new man, but the problem was that I couldn't get off the drug and I haven't been able to get off the drug since. I've been able to cut down a lot. So, you know, it's been a good thing. It saved me. Um, but the what I meant to say, what I was going to say is the difference between Seroxat and Prozac is that I'm quite... I have depression, which, you know, I feel down, you know, maybe sometimes even suicidal. I think, you know, there's no point in life and stuff like that. But I'm also anxious. Anxiety is a kind of, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very energetic con condition. If you're angry, if you're anxious, you know. And Prozac, what, for me, what Prozac seems to do is it gets rid of the, the depression and ups your energy. My energy is already up. I don't need anything to up my energy. And so, created like an explosion of energy. I was too confident, and I didn't know what to do with this energy, so I felt, um, I felt like, uh, I don't know, I felt like very physical, you know. I had to do something physical, like hit someone or whatever. So it wasn't good. Seroxat, on the other hand, the way Seroxat works with me, 
like my personality, high anxiety, anxious, uh, potentially an anxious kind of person, and depression. It calms your depression and calms down the anxiety at the same time. So Seroxat really worked for me. So it depends what the kind of person you are. If you're a person that is really down and talks like this and is really depressed, you know, and I have anxiety, well, Prozac will probably work for you. You know, I'm not a psychiatrist, but, you know, it would probably probably work for a person like that. But if, you're, if you have, like, a, a kind of personality similar to, similar to mine, oh, you're anxious, but you feel really down, you don't care about life, you cry and stuff like that, then Seroxat would work, I would assume, you know? So, taking an antidepressant, you know, if you are, if you do feel suicidal, try to think of what type of person you are, the psychiatrist or doctor, can't just give you any, any drug, you know, so explain to them the kind of person you are, oh, I'm, I'm really anxious, but I've got lots of energy, you know, I, I feel nervous, I can't sleep, or you could, you know, I mean, they should diagnose, ideally, you should say this, to, I mean, they should diagnose you properly, you know, but how many times, you know, people have taken Seroxat and have gone nuts, you know, because they, they, they're the wrong kind of person to, to be taking Seroxat, or people have taken Prozac and have have reacted really badly like I did. I tell you, I would never take it again. Um, so, to cut a long story short, you could take um, you could take an antidepressant, you know, and I think. If I w was to give myself this advice, it would be don't take the full amount. So, for example, if the doctor says, okay, you can start with t 20 milligram of Seroxat. Uh, take one a day and then after, after a few weeks it should kick in, you should feel okay. Yeah, but because they've never taken it in their lives and they just see you as a, sometimes as a number, you know, you're just a, a, a number, you're just a, a name, you know, you, uh, oh. uh, sorry, what was I saying, yeah, you're just, sometimes, it seems to me you're just a number, you know, oh, this person, you're like a case history, this person has a, uh, you're not a real person, you know what I mean? So, you know, they don't have to take this medication, you know, taking 20 milligrams of, I don't know, Seroxat, for example, you know, it's gonna make a massive uh, uh, shift in your brain. It's going to, uh, the, the gears are gonna shift in your brain. The brain chemistry is gonna bloody change. You know, like all your life, you've never taken any medication. Suddenly, 20 milligrams of Seroxat. You know, um, your brain takes a jolt. You know, your brain's not used to it. And when brain chemistry changes, like drastically like that, um, you're gonna, you could feel these things. I tell you what I felt when I first started taking it. Panic attacks got worse. I started to feel panicky. I had a, a butterfly, you know, fluttering up from my stomach up to my throat. <gasps> I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. I just could not breathe. It's like I just um, drank like ten cups of tea, five cups of coffee. It causes hyperventilation, dizziness. Um, it can cause sweating. I remember going to bed and I had like a million dreams. You know when you have a flu, flu-like symptoms, you go to bed and you have like a million dreams. That's what I felt. It felt so uncomfortable. So these kind of... Uh, see, I'm feeling panicky just talking about all this. You know, and I didn't take my medication this morning, so 
I think I have to uh, sign off here and do what I'm supposed to do. My head feels very light now. See, other some people might be saying, how can you give advice? Look at you. I'm the best person to give advice because I'm going through this. I've gone through this all my life. And even though I'm a lot better, you see, it never goes away. But the periods in your in your day where you feel, or in the week that you feel terrible, are much less. So, there you go. The no bullshit approach to uh, a life. You know, I'm not a hero. I'm not this strong person that, you know, my kids think I am. You know, my, my son, my daughter, people around me think that I'm so tough. I'm just fat, you know? I'm fat, I'm overweight. Um, no, I don't feel sorry about, about myself. I used to feel sorry about myself, but that's what I am. Um, I need to be a bit healthier, I need to be a bit stronger, but it's difficult with my arthritis I've got in my shoulders here. It's really difficult because I've got hypermobile, uh, hyperlax joints, so if I try to do a press up, then I end up having terrible pain later on in the day. I can do squats, but I can't build up my chest or, you know, I've got acid reflux, so it's difficult. To, uh, to have a six pack because um, I can't do sit ups, you know, because I've got acid reflux. So I've been driving around and I'm lost now. I don't know where the hell I am. It, it's your fault. Let me see where this takes me. I think I've been here before. I have to put my GPS on, otherwise. My wife is going to go nuts. I'll see you guys later because I'm going to be in trouble soon. Oh, fuck it. She can wait. I don't mean that in a bad way, but you know, if I'm dizzy and I, I have to calm down a little bit, I'm not going to rush and like kill myself or somebody just because uh, she might be upset. No. I think she'd rather have a uh, a late husband than a dead one. See you guys later. And I'll talk more about this later. I'll try to uh, think about this subject, write it down, and then um, um, do a, a more in-depth kind of uh, video. <laughs> if it's possible for me to do an in-depth kind of video, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, let me put my GPS on. Otherwise, I don't know really where the hell I'm, I'm just going round and round. I'm walking alone, the streets are empty. Is my own silhouette I'm getting stronger Step by step The clock is ticking But there's no time for me I've been flying from town to town From London to Taiwan I've been all around the globe Trying to protect your soul